Hello everybody, this is Tim, AD4CJ, and the presentation for today is Solar Power for Ham Radio Operators. Uh, I belong to a group in Williamson County, Tennessee, which is just south of Nashville, called WCARES, that's Williamson County Amateur Radio Emergency Services Group. We've got over 100 ham radio operators in our group that are very active. We cover all aspects of ham radio from emergency communication, HF work, VHF work, um, digital stuff. So one of the things that a lot of our members have been very interested in was alternative power sources for their ham radio station, particularly in emergency situations where gasoline might not be available for their generators. And they asked me to put together this talk on solar power for ham radio operators. I first gave the presentation in November of 2014 at one of our monthly meetings, and I have updated the presentation this month to uh, cover th QRP operation. Uh, and I think a lot of people are very interested in QRP operation, so please uh, stay tuned. Uh, the first thing we've got to do when we look at power requirements is to define our mission parameters. How much power do you really need for your situation. And when we speak of power, are we talking about watts or volts or amps? Well, most of the batteries that we're going to be using are listed as having a quantity of amp hours. So we're really going to focus on amps. So what exactly is an amp? Well, an amp is how current is measured. It is really the rate of electron flow. And the precise definition of an amp is a coulomb, which is a lot of electrons that travel per second. Now, we're going to need to calculate our amp requirements for using our ham radios. And the amp requirements are going to be the current used in the receive mode times the percentage of time that we are in receive, plus the transmit current times the percentage of time we're in transmit, times the duty cycle. For those of you that like algebra, this is the algebraic equation that we're talking about. But I am going to make it a lot more simple for uh, the rest of us uh, mere mortals. So the first thing we need to do is look at common average duty cycles. This is a page from the ARRL handbook that looked at conversational sideband duty cycles and conversational CW duty cycles. And you see those are about 40% of the time. So that means when I'm speaking on phone on HF bands, or when I'm speaking with Morse code on HF bands, about 40% of the time I'm actually using the transmission function and using the amps that are required for transmitting. Well, the radio that I use for my Go kit is a typical HF radio. It's a Kenwood TS570 all band, all mode radio. And if we take a look at its specifications in transmit, it uses 20 and a half amps. And in receive without receiving a signal, it uses two amps of energy. So how are we going to do our calculation for energy requirements? Well, let's assume that two, thir two thirds of the time we're listing and one a third of the time we're transmitting. And that's really how it should be. Remember, you really need to be able to listen better than you can speak. Uh, just keep in mind that we were built with two ears and one mouth. So uh, listen twice as much as what you are speaking. And let's also assume a duty cycle of about 40%. Well, what we will do is take two thirds of the time, two thirds times two amps for receive, and add to that one third of the time at 20 and a half amps, times a 40% duty cycle. And that tells us that we're using 4.1 amps each hour we are using the Kenwood 570, assuming that we're listening two thirds of the time and transmitting one third of the time and have a 40% duty cycle. Well, if I operate for eight hours, I'm going to need eight times that much energy or about 33 amps. Now, we can reduce our amp usage if we go QRP. Uh, another radio that I have that many of our members use and really love 
is a QRP radio, the Elecraft KX3. And if we look at the specifications from the KX3, the KX3 uses 1 to 2 amps in transmit and 150 milliamps minimum on receive. Now that's if you have the backlight off, the preamp off, and there is no signal. In reality, uh, just looking at the measured usage I get with my KX3, it's going to be closer to about 200 milliamps on receive. So let's do the same calculations for QRP. We will assume that two-thirds of the time we will be listening, one-third of the time we will be transmitting, and we assume a duty cycle of 40%, and it really doesn't matter whether it's sideband phone usage or CW conversational usage, it's still about 40%. So under these conditions, we take two-thirds of the time and multiply that times 0.2 amps, which is 200 milliamps, and add one-third of the time to 2 amps on the high end times 40%, which is the 40% duty cycle, and that gives us less than a half an amp each hour. And if I operate this radio for 8 hours, I'm going to need a total of 3.2 amps. It's really important that you choose a battery that has at least three times your energy requirements. Why is that? Well, you may have a day when you have cloudy or overcast conditions and don't have any sunlight. It may be raining and you can't put your stuff outside. And you want to be able to operate for a couple of days in a row without completely depleting your batteries. And speaking of batteries, let's take a look at the different types of batteries that are available for us to use. Well, the lead acid batteries are the type of battery that you've got in your car or maybe the type of battery that you use for your trolling motor in your bass boat. They're big, they're heavy, they're messy, but they are economical. They're available everywhere and they're fairly easy to get. Uh, another type of lead acid battery is called AGM. That, that stands for absorbed glass mat. They are big, heavy they're because they're lead acid. They're economical, but they're not messy because these are sealed batteries. So you can use them inside without worrying about uh, the battery acid spilling. And then another type of battery that many of us have started to use lately are these lithium iron phosphate batteries. They're smaller, they're lighter, they have a really good energy density, but they are more expensive. They're going to cost about four times the expense of a typical lead acid battery. When we look at the battery capacity, the ma manufacturers measure ba battery capacity by discharging their batteries all the way down to zero volts over 20 hours. Now, if you do that to your battery, you will kill it deader than a zombie with a spike in its head. Do not discharge your battery all the way down to zero volts. Uh, I've got a uh, battery analyzer from West Mountain Radio, and I used it to run a couple of battery tests on a couple of different batteries. Uh, this is a battery test that was a Duracell 7 amp hour AGM lead acid battery, and I was drawing it down at a half an amp current um, dispersion. And drawing at a half an amp, I got right at 7 amps of energy out of that battery until the battery voltage dropped from a start of 13 volts down to 10 and a half volts. And you don't want to drop these batteries much lower than 10 and a half volts. Uh, additionally, I've got a uh, lithium iron phosphate battery uh, that is listed at 9 amp hours and it has a much flatter discharge curve. This one I discharged at uh, uh, 5% of its rate, which is 0.45 amps, just under a half an amp. And I was able to get uh, nine and a half amps out of this battery. And notice the really flat discharge curve. Uh, it, it gets really flat. And in fact, once it hit 12 volts, then it suddenly dropped off and went down uh, pretty quickly. Now, when we look at the batteries you're planning on using for your ham radio operation, plan on getting only about 70% of the stated battery capacity. Now remember for my TS-70, I needed 33 amps in eight hours of operating with two-thirds of the time listing and one-third of the time transmitting on 100 watts. And then I'm going to multiply that uh, times 70%. So I'm going to need uh, 141 amp hours. 
Uh, in other words, if I assume I'm only going to get 70% of the power, uh, I want to divide uh, 99 amps by the 70% to get 141 amp hours. This assumes that I am transmitting with 100 watts. But the other thing that's really important is that I can always reduce the power. So let's do the calculations for the KX3. Remember, for the KX3, operating for 8 hours, I only needed 3.2 amps. So let's triple that, and I get 9.6 amp hours that I need. Uh, and I'm not going to use 70% of this because I'm looking with this radio, I'm using that lithium iron phosphate battery. So with my 9-hour lithium iron phosphate battery, I should have plenty of power uh, in the battery. Now let's talk about radio transmission power. Does a lower transmit power limit me? Well, let's assume that the receiving station is hearing me and has an S9 signal on his meter. We're all familiar with the S meters on our radios, and an S9 signal is a really good, loud signal. That is, assuming that your noise floor is only S2 or S3. Uh, so let's assume that the receiving station has got an S9 signal when I transmit 100 watts of RF power. If I cut back to 25 watts, I've reduced my power by a factor of 4. A factor of 4 represents 6 decibels, a 6 decibel power difference. It's important to realize that each S unit on your S meter actually represents 6 decibels of difference. So my 25 watt signal will be received as an S8 signal if my 100 watt signal was S9. What happens if I cut that 25 watts in 4, uh, in four again? That means my 6 watt signal will be reduced to about S7. So going from 100 watts down to 6 watts, I've reduced my received signal from an S9 to only an S7. Still very, very readable. So let's, at this point, get into talking about solar panels and how to charge these batteries using solar panels. There are really three types of solar panel. There are monocrystalline solar panel. These are the ones, for instance, that Goal Zero sells. Uh, they're fairly expensive. Uh, they are solid and rigid. Uh, the next type is polycrystalline. They are probably the least expensive solar panels, but they are bigger and they are heavier. And if you were going to use them at a fixed lo location, that would be perfectly fine. The ones that I really like are the thin film panels. These are foldable and rollable. And actually, my panels I got from a company called Power Film Solar. Uh, they were at Dayton a couple of years ago, and uh, I picked up a couple of panels from them. Now, when you buy the panels, realize that they are sold by wattage. You get a 5-watt, 15-watt, 30-watt, 60-watt panel. These solar panels, they're also known as PV panels or photovoltaic panels, they have a voltage of 15.4 volts when they are placed on a load. Now, remember the power formula. Uh, I like to say it's easy as pi, P equals I times Z, that is Power equals current times voltage, or electromotive force. So a 30-watt panel will deliver 1.8 amps of charging power. That is, we take the 15.4 volts, multiply it by the 1.8 amps, and we get about 27.7 watts. A 60-watt panel will deliver 3.6 amps of charging current. That's 15.4 volts on load times 3.6 amps. That's about 55.5 watts. Your output of these panels, however, will be reduced if you've got cloudy or overcast conditions. They're also reduced by cosine effect. In other words, the output is greatest when the sun is directly overhead the panel at 90 degrees to the panel. When the sun moves away from directly overhead, in other words, when there is an angle different than 90 degrees created to the panel, then it will be reduced by the cosine of that angle. So that's the so-called cosine effect. Your output will also be reduced by fewer hours of available sunlight. For instance, in the winter, we have fewer hours of sunlight than we do in the summer. However, the other downside of using these in the summer is that heat tends to make the panels less efficient. When they get warm, when they get above 80 degrees Fahrenheit, they do lose some of their efficiency as well. Now, I used that West Mountain Radio 
battery analyzer uh, to determine how my solar panels work. So I've got a 30 watt solar panel and I increased the current draw when this was under direct sunlight in the middle of a brightly lit day. And there is a point when you get a knee on the curve when it suddenly falls off. And for this 30 watt panel, that was a current draw at about one and a half to 1.7 amps or so. And you can very clearly see that as we start drawing more amps, that the power output starts to drop dramatically. One of the things that's going to be important when you use these solar panels is a charge controller. Now, you could just wire the solar panel directly up to the battery, but you're going to be feeding the battery with 15 and a half volts. You don't want to do that. Additionally, at night when the panel is not being lit, you could get reversal of the charge going from the battery into the panel. You don't want that to happen either. So we prevent overcharging and we regulate the charging of the battery with a device named a charge controller. And there are a couple of different types of charge controller. The MPPT charge controller, that stands for Modified PowerPoint Tracking Charge Controller, is quite expensive, but it's very efficient. It changes the charge current depending upon the power coming to it from the solar panels and depending upon the size of your battery bank and how charged it is. These are the kind of solar controllers that you will use uh, in a home-based solar system. For instance, if you've got your house wired for solar, you would be uh, using an MPPT controller. You could also use these portable, but they are more expensive. They're talking anywhere from $200 to $500 each. Uh, a less costly uh, controller is the PWM controller. That stands for Pulse Width Modulation Controller. Uh, the one shown here is actually sold by PowerFilm Solar. It's their RA-9. Uh, it sells for about 80 bucks or so on Amazon. And uh, it can handle up to four and a half amps of charge power um, into the batteries. What these charge controllers will do will prevent overcharging your batteries. They will prevent reverse discharge of your battery at night back into the panel. The important thing to keep in mind is they can have some significant RF noise. Now, the PowerFilm RA9 controller that I use is, is pretty electrically quiet. And uh, I'll run my radio with it between the solar panel and the battery, and I run off the battery and really don't have any problem. You can also use a couple of these charge controllers in parallel to charge faster if your battery can accept the charge rate. And that's really important for you to check. How fast can your battery be charged? Those lithium iron phosphate batteries actually can be charged uh, almost at their full uh, output rating. So you could actually charge them at, at nine amps and, and uh, they work just fine for my nine amp hour battery. So uh, in summary, what you really need to do when you look at solar power is to determine your energy requirements. You want to choose a battery based on those requirements and choose a large enough solar panel to replenish your total current that you're going to use. Um, solar panels, the foldable panels that I got from PowerFilm Solar, are running over a little, a little over ten dollars a watt. Uh, just looking at Amazon today, the thirty watt panels are going for about three hundred and fifty dollars, and the sixty watt panels are going for about six hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, but they are small; they fold up very nice into a small container, and they're very easy to use. Additionally, make sure that you use a charge controller to prevent overcharging your batteries. That's really very important. Most of all, uh, I'd like you to have fun. Uh, that's all I've got today on solar power for ham radio operators. I'd like to thank you for uh, attending this presentation. Uh, I want to wish everybody 73. Uh, if you have a chance, check out our website at www.wcares.org. That's W-C-A-R-E-S dot O-R-G. And you'll see some of these lectures, some additional lectures we've got. Uh, lots of good information. Look forward to talking to you on the air soon. 73, this is 84CJ.